Are you ready? Meow. <laughs> Welcome back, creeps. Hey, y'all. Happy Friday. Meow. They said it couldn't be done. <laughs> but you made it. Well done. It's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So today is actually a double creep day. So... Thankfully, we recorded the Titillating Tales episodes a few days ago. So if you hear us saying similar stuff on the intro, well, apologies. But I don't really remember what we were talking about. Yeah. How was your week? Um. Oh, you mean like in regards to how our week has gone? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, since you last asked me a few days ago... That was the last time we spoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since we last spoke a few days ago. Yeah. Uh, everything's good on my end. You know, me just worrying about everything and worrying about like all little stuff, but then like escaping into Animal Crossing. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely been doing similar stuff. Like my mind's been going a mile a minute mm -hmm. and there's so much going on that I'm like, well, Better watch this YouTube video <laughs> and not get anything actually done. <laughs> yeah, big Probably time. mechanisms, y'all. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty sure that's why I read like fucking three and a half Harry Potter books in like two weeks, a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, this week's Patreon of the week is our friend Marissa. Marissa. This is a big shout out for you. Thank you very much. We love you dearly. Yes. Thank you for being you. Yep. That was a really nice pop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, I think we're going to get straight into it. Oh, also, you were right about that coffee. We got coffee yesterday at like Marshall's or something. Mm -hmm. I still feel strange when I buy anything other than clothes at Marshall's. But uh, it's like spooky coffee. It said spooky coffee. There was a ghost on it. So we bought it. Spooky enough for me. Yeah. And it's actually really freaking good. Yeah. You like it? Yeah, I really did, yeah. Mm. So now we're only going to get our coffee from Marshalls. Also, in case you didn't know, I got a got a new car this week. So we now have two creep mobiles and the creep fleet. Yeah, we put uh, beans in them. Yeah. Oh, actually, that was a really good idea. It was very strong yesterday. Gave me a headache. Mm. But when I got out of work earlier and I was driving home, I was like, this smells really fucking good. Yeah. So we got these uh, car fresheners that are shaped like jelly beans uh they're jelly bean or jelly belly brand and they smell very very strong and i got cherry and adam got fruit punch his has glitter on it yes but um yeah so that's what we mean when we say we got beans for the car and my niece <laughs> saw one and she was like oh my god mommy we need a bean too for our car and so i gave her one of my beans so beans now, all around so we're all beaned up <laughs> 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 okay, anyway, I think you're going to go first this week. All right, so my sources are wiki, jimbtucker.com, Collective Evolution and Learn Religions. We're going to talk about children remembering past lives. Oh, shit. But before we do, just a little background. One of the names that popped up in my research was Ian Prettyman Stevenson. A Canada man. He worked for the University of Virginia School of Medicine for 50 years as a chair of the Department of Psychiatry. During his time there, he was the founder and director of the university's Division of Perceptual Studies, which investigates the paranormal. That, what a cool fucking right? job to have, yeah. The research that made him famous in the paranormal circle were his studies that had to do with reincarnation. He investigated 3,000 cases of children who claimed to remember a past life. That's insane. He believed that reincarnation was a third factor to what makes a person in addition to genetics and environment. Isn't that interesting? That is cool. Even if it's like something that he only kind of had an inkling of. of yeah. Like, but he was like, well, let's just have a look. <laughs> but he did it hard. Like, <laughs> Yeah. No, that's really cool. And we should also mention Dr. Jim Tucker, who was amongst those that were a part of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the same university. He is a key figure in continuing Stevenson's work after he retired. Tucker has written Life Before Life, Return to Life, and most recently, Before, 
Children, Memories of Previ Previous Lives, which is the two books I mentioned before with a new story included in the introduction. All this is to say that there are too many cases like this to ignore or chalk up to coincidence. It could be that these kids simply are lacking a vitamin or something <laughs> that make them believe they used to be someone else. But That's just vitamin B12. Maybe. But why are their memories so detailed that they can be traced to real people in the past? I don't know. It scares me. I love it. I, I love the, these stories. According to Tucker, the subjects usually stop making their past life statements by the age of six to seven. And most seem to lose the purported memories. This is the age when children start school and begin having more experiences in the current life, as well as when they tend to lose their early childhood memories. He also has a hypothesis on how reincarnation. So Tucker's research has yielded uh, different kinds of patterns among cases of children claiming memories of a past life. So the medium age at the time of the previous person's death, like their past life persona, yeah, is 28. Oh. Yeah. So generally at the time of their deaths in the previous life is 28 years old. Most children claiming memories of a past life are usually between the ages of 2 and 6. 60% 60 of children who claim past life memories are male. Roughly 70% of the children claim they died a violent or unnatural death. In those cases, just over 70% of the deceased individuals were male, the same ratio as in, this, as in the general population. 90% of the children say that they were the same sex in a previous life as they are now. Mm -hmm. The median time between claim death and rebirth is 16 months. And 20% of those children claim memories of the time between death and rebirth. So they can remember that gap of time between when they died and when they were born again. And what happens in between? Are you going to tell us? Maybe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into the stories, yeah? Please. Okay. So this little boy's story. Uh, so we're going to call him P.M., PM was a boy whose half-brother had died from neuroblastoma 12 years before he was born. The half-brother was diagnosed after he began limping and then suffered a pathological fracture in his left tibia. He underwent a biopsy of a nodule on his scalp just above his right ear and received chemotherapy through a central line in his right external jugular vein. At the time of his death, he was two years old and blind in his left eye. Jesus, that's awful. PM was born with three birthmarks that matched the lesions on his half-brother, as well as with a swelling one centimeter in diameter above his right ear and a dark slanting mark on the lower right anterior surface of his neck. He also had what's known as a corneal leucoma, which caused him to be virtually blind in his left eye. As soon as PM started to walk, he did so with a limp, sparing his left side, and around the age of four and a half years old, he spoke to his mother about wanting to return to the family's previous home, describing it with great accuracy. He also spoke of his brother's scalp surgery, even though he had never been told of it before. That's crazy. Yeah. The thing I love about these stories is because they're so young, Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you're not going to explain a fucking scalp surgery that your dead half-brother had 12 mm -hmm. years. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just one of those things that you really don't think the parents talked about with a child. Yeah, not that long afterwards. Like, you know what I mean? Well, not even that. Oh, and yeah. Like, sorry, and to their child. Yeah. Exactly. To their tiny, tiny child. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chennai. This is another story. Okay. Chennai is a boy from Thailand who when he was three years old, began saying that he had been a teacher named Wai Kai who had been shot and killed as he rode his bike to school. He pleaded and begged to be taken to Wai Kai's parents, who he felt were his own parents. He knew the village where they lived and eventually convinced his grandmother to take him there. According to the research, quote, his grandmother reported that after they got off the bus, 
Chennai led her to a house where an older couple lived. Chennai appeared to recognize the couple, who were the parents of Bua Kai Lanak, a teacher who had been shot and killed on the way to school five years before Chennai was born. End quote. The fascinating thing is that Kai and Chennai had something in common. Kai, who was shot from behind, had small round wounds on the back of his head, typical of an entry wound, and a larger exit wound on his forehead. Chennai was born with two birthmarks, a small round birthmark on the back of his head and a larger irregularly shaped one towards the front. That's mental. <laughs> I can't even, like... I can't even comment on these stories. I think I'm just going to be sitting here going, wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It makes me wonder about the birthmark that I have on my belly. Because it kind of looks like if someone were to stab me with a knife and like go like this, like side to side, that's what it probably would look like. Or if you were to get stabbed with a spear or impaled with something. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Next story. Sam Taylor is one child Tucker studied and wrote about. Born 18 months after his paternal grandfather died, he first began recalling details of a past life when he was just over a year old. Quote, when he was a year and a half, he looked up as his father was changing his diaper and said, when I was your age, I used to change your diapers. Whoa. He began talking more about having been his grandfather. He eventually told details of his grandfather's life that his parents felt certain he could not have learned through normal means, such as the fact that his grandfather's sister had been murdered and that his grandmother had used a food processor to make milkshakes for his grandfather every day at the end of his life. That's like such a random fucking... What happened to his sister? Or I didn't say. No. All right. Next is Ryan's story. Ryan's story began when he was four years old, when he was experiencing frequent horrible nightmares. Once he turned five, he made an announcement to his mother. He told her, I used to be somebody else. He would often talk about going home to Hollywood and would beg his mother to take him there. He told her detailed stories about meeting stars like Rita Hayworth, dancing in Broadway productions, and working for an agency where people would frequently change their names. He even remembered that the name of the street he used to live on had the word rock in it. Ryan's mother, Cindy, said that his stories were so detailed and they were so extensive that it just wasn't like a child could have made it up. Cindy decided to check out some books about Hollywood from her local library. Remember those guys? <laughs> thinking that maybe something inside would catch her son's attention, and it did. Cindy said that once she found a specific picture of the man Ryan claims to have been in his past life, everything changed. They decided to seek Jim Tucker's help, who took on the case and started his research. After only approximately two weeks, a Hollywood film archivist was able to confirm the identity of the man in the photo. The picture was from a film titled Night After Night, and the man was Marty Martin, who had been a movie extra and then later became a powerful Hollywood agent before passing away in 1964. Martin had in fact danced in Broadway, worked at an agency where stage names were often created for new clients, traveled overseas to Paris, and lived at 823 North Roxbury Drive in Beverly Hills. Whoa. These were all details that Ryan was able to communicate to Tucker before they learned the identity of who he described. For example, Ryan knew that the address had rocks in it. Ryan was able to recall how many children Martin had and how many times he was married. More remarkable still is the fact that Ryan knew Martin had two sisters, but Martin's own daughter did not. Ryan also remembers having an African-American maid. Marty and his wife employed several. 
These are just a few of 55 incredible facts that Ryan can remember from his previous life as Marty Martin, though as he ages, his memories become increasingly dim. That's like, that's a movie waiting to be made. (laughs) I feel like that's one of the most compelling cases that I've come across. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say a lot of them are just like, oh, well, I remember living on a farm and I had a blue car and then that's it. Or and I had a chicken, yeah. Yeah. All right, next story. When my daughter was in kindergarten, she had the hardest time with letters. Mixed up B's with B's and H's with N's for a few. Her teacher didn't know how such letters could be mixed up and neither could I until I was helping her read one night. She kept asking me what sounds the letters made. She kept saying, I don't remember those. I showed her an H and asked her if she remembered that one. She nodded and said confidently, that makes an N sound. She kept saying how she thought there were more letters. I asked her what kind of letters she thought there were, and she wrote some out for me. And just so you guys know, they're Cyrillic alphabets used in Slavic languages. She's Whoa. not <laughs> she's not from there. <laughs> so she wrote out actual Yeah, letters, like just the characters, not yeah. Of her alphabet. Exactly. More than that too, she said. I asked her where she learned those, and she said, Vlad taught me before he disappeared. I asked her who Vlad is. She claimed that he was her brother. She kept telling me that he disappeared and the next day a man came and killed her family whoa yeah jesus that's deep it is i wonder are there are people still like like that little girl i wonder if she's still afraid like does she still have the emotions that she felt with that memory of her old family being killed or is it just like so matter of fact for her that it's like no it's just what happened you know on some of these stories i've noticed that sometimes when they say these things like Brian, he it, it kind of seemed like he remembered the entire time. Yeah. But there are some cases where some of these kids blurt out these memories or they'll have bursts of emotions that are that accompany these memories. Yeah. And then in the next second they deny ever saying those things or they don't remember what they just said. So it's just like a fleeting glimpse. Mm-hmm. That's fucking bloody mental in it. In it. All right, here's a short one. My four-year-old told me about the time she went for a swim in the lake and could hear her mom yelling and crying out to her, but she couldn't come because she was under the ducks. Then she remembers falling asleep. And when she woke up, I was her new mommy. I think I'd return that kid. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how I would deal with that. Like, what? Yeah. And here's the last one. This just breaks my mind. (laughs) Yeah, no, I remember reading a story about this little girl who said that she died, like she got hurt really bad. She hit her head and then she just went up to God and then came down and now she had a new family. No, I cannot comprehend this. (laughs) All right, the last story. My daughter used to dream about the Egyptian pyramids. It wasn't until the age of eight that she truly could describe the inside of a pharaoh's tomb in great detail. She used to describe the wonder in the relationship between members of the royal family and their subjects. These included many female royals, secret discussion with their ladies' mates, and the battles between them and other women for the pharaoh's affections. She vividly recalls conversations outside hieroglyphics held in secret between one female whom she describes as a goddess and her protector. Whoa. Yeah. Can you imagine like we could actually study these and get a real like if you could prove, okay, because obviously I want to believe all of these stories because they're just, you know, children and like they're just telling their honest answers or, or experiences or whatever. Yeah. But, like, if we could prove it, the amount of information we could get from them, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, who was this man that murdered that little girl's family? Yeah, and 
or how it, did society work? <laughs> one of the things that the research yielded is that a lot of the peoples whose who whose past life it was, they weren't very like famous or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't have kids claiming out, you know, out here claiming to be Elvis or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, because they read his fucking yeah. biography or something like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the like that Ryan kid. He remembers being an extra. Yeah, like you know so what I mean? that's exactly what I was thinking when you said yeah. he was an extra and then an agent. Mm-hmm. No one remembers the extras. All right, well, good job. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good job on your story. Thanks, thanks, um, Adam. That's one of those subjects that I feel like the deeper and deeper I get, the more and more confused and melted my brain is going to feel. Don't you just love it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my story this week, well, so rather than doing like a deep, deep dive, I have a couple of, I have a theme. Yeah. And a couple of different stories from that theme. Cool. Keeping one, it casual. Yeah, Keep one it. is probably more famous, but I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with one close to home. We should call our podcast Casual Creep. Casual Creep. Yeah. This one is a little more casual than we're used to. Anyway, my sources this week are Esquire.com, scarymommy.com, which I think I've used before. KPRC, Facebook, the lineup.com, K2 News, and Atlas Obscura. So our story begins Christmas time, 2013. Mm. A young girl by the name of Aurelia Madonia or Madonia, I don't know, in none other than Houston, Texas, mm. actually Sugarland, but, you know, close enough. That's like an hour away. It's close enough <laughs> on the scale of things. <laughs> anyway, somebody get, she's about a year old and somebody gives her an Elsa doll. Okay. A doll of Elsa from the movie Frozen. <laughs> doll of Elsa. A doll of Elsa. Yeah, that sounds like a... Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's a talking Elsa doll yeah. from the movie Frozen. Yeah. The movie. Just a regular little doll. It has like a necklace on it with a blue stone. And that blue stone is a button. And when you press it, she'll say pre-programmed phrases. Yeah. And she's bilingual. Oh, nice. Yeah, so she can check that off when she's filling out for jobs on Indeed. Love that shit. Yeah, so she speaks in either English or Spanish, this particular one. Nothing, like, fucking weird or anything. But around two years later, because, again, the baby was only a year old, you know what I mean? So it just kind of sat in the playroom or something. Yeah. And around two years later, it started saying it's pre-programmed phrases but it had suddenly switched to spanish okay which okay that's fine because it speaks spanish yeah because it speaks spanish but like it decided that it was speaking spanish now fine okay <laughs> yeah Technology. like it, it was a personal choice yeah and then it would start to alternate between english and spanish at random mm-hmm. and again there wasn't any button that the parents like could find that was causing this or anything now when you say alternating do you mean like it would say a spanish phrase and then later it'd say an english phrase on yes. its own and then go back and forth or was she speaking spanglish no no no. like she wasn't making up words or dipping in and out it okay. was complete phrases okay. in either spanish or english okay still not that weird not that weird at all like this whole story is fairly benign okay so I now we're say. mundane creep now we're mundane creep. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, again it just seemed like the doll was choosing at random other random shit like this would happen throughout the years like it would just randomly start speaking like on its own without having the button pressed like, okay a glitch okay yeah they'd all be sitting there in the house and then all of a sudden they would hear like let it go all right in fucking but- spanish in the other room <laughs> annoying but fair yeah so they turned it off completely because they were like, this is fucking bothering us. Like they took the batteries out. They didn't take the batteries out, but they turned the switch off. But they never changed the batteries and they had this doll for six years. Okay. And it never faltered in fucking saying its phrases and singing at random. Either way, the family just didn't take much notice of it. They just thought like that. It's just a glitchy little doll. It's fine. But And also this could have been because it happened like so infrequently over the course of six years. But in 2019, the mom, 
Emily Madonia, or Madonia, who was a violinist, by the way. Cool. She was doing a big clear out and putting together like a donation bag. It was around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And she finds the Elsa doll. Mm -hmm. But it was all like, she said, germy, like just a kid's gross toy. Yeah. Yeah. And it had also been like colored in with marker and stuff like that. As you do. Yeah. So she couldn't, she felt bad donating it to a charity shop. So she just said, oh, we better just throw it out. Quote, right before we got rid of it, it would only speak Spanish. And it stopped singing. It was only talking whether we pushed the button or not. Okay. So her and her husband threw it in a rubbish bag along with other rubbish and then put it in the outside bin for the bin men to come and take it, which they did. Mm -hmm. A week later, I think this is actually Christmas Eve, it happened. A week later, and they're looking for something in the house and they open up a rarely used bench which had like all books and stuff on it. They used it to store shit on top as Mm -hmm. well as in it. But wouldn't you know it, sitting in there, quote, on top of a bunch of blankets and stuff, is Elsa. Whoa. Matt started yelling and I ran. He definitely had thrown it away. There's no way the kids would have taken it out of the garbage, but we asked them about it anyway, and they were completely confused. So after Matt and I argued about who was going to have to touch it to get rid of it, (laughs) we finally got it in the garbage bag using rubber gloves and tied it tight and took it back out to the garbage outside underneath a bunch of other garbage. I don't even know what to think about all this except nope. (laughs) So that post was on the 24th of December 2019. Okay. And that went viral. Oh, wow. I think she may have like deleted some posts off her Facebook. I was, that's what I was trying to go through earlier. Mm -hmm. She is an avid Facebook poster. I'm talking multiple posts a day, every day, Mm. since at least the 24th of December, 2019, because I had to go through so much crap. But she was getting hounded by news stories, podcast people, um, (laughs) like just randomers, like messaging her. She was like, they're not even in English. Like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And she ended up having to lock her Facebook page and be like, "Okay, leave me the fuck alone, everybody. Yeah. So on January 15th, she posted saying that she had to lock her Facebook because of all this stuff. She was being harassed. Her family were being harassed. Weird. People just straight up being like, this is wrong. Like, this isn't true. Blah, blah, blah. Because after after they threw away the doll the second time and they were double sure they'd use the rubber gloves, double tied plastic bags and stuff like that. Like, they put the doll in its own plastic bag. Yeah. Inside of a plastic bag. As if it was expired food. Put in a bag, in a bag, in the bin, underneath all the rubbish. It sounds like an old Scout song that we used to sing. Yeah. Anyway, they went out of town and forgot about it. Okay. This is an actual quote from her Facebook. Today, Aurelia says, Mom, I saw the Elsa doll again in the backyard. (gasps) And then in all capitals... Help us get rid of this haunted doll. Also, they knew it was the same doll because... Because of the markings on the face. Because of the markers on the face. Yes, exactly. They grilled the kids because they were like... Oh, why would they do that? If if you're fucking with us... (laughs) You get it? Tell us. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, it's it's terrible. (laughs) So... (laughs) But no, they asked the kids, they're like, you better not be fucking with us because, like, this is serious. Like, it's all over the news now. Yeah. They grabbed him by the front of their shirt and be like, you better not be fucking with us. (laughs) Listen to me, (laughs) Orenda. No, but they were totally positive that they weren't being pranked. Like, they asked their fucking family and everything. And she said, like, they they were taking this so seriously because her and her husband were not sleeping. Now, like, they were so freaked out because this fucking doll kept turning up. So, okay. They said that they saw the Elsa doll in the backyard. Did they go back there and, and verify? Yes. And it was sitting back there. It was like in the corner of the house. So did they touch it or just leave yeah, it there? Yeah, no, no, no. She took it and... Uh, Tossed it. No. So I don't know what where she kept it the second time. Yeah. But she had a video like of her like pushing the buttons to show people that it would only speak Spanish and... Blah, blah, blah. And that video was taken, I'm pretty sure, where they found it outside oh, okay. of the house. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know whether she just left it outside. But either way, they were saying like, well, if we're not being pranked, either it's this doll haunted. is haunted yeah. or somebody's breaking into our house, leaving the doll hidden yeah, 
after taking it out of the garbage yeah or like climbing over our back fence and leaving it there for us to find which is unlikely who would go through the trouble unlikely but just as fucking scary oh, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah anyway in the meantime an online friend of emily's reached out saying that he would gladly take elsa off his hands this online friend I think they met through like one of, you know, the way you do your your Fitbit steps thing. Mm-hmm. And there's all different people in the group. Mm-hmm. So he was a running friend. A running friend. Yeah. Better and catch him. <laughs> 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 but the two had never met. And okay. they, they came up with an agreement saying like, neither of them were going to know the other's address. So Chris Hogan had Emily box the doll up and ship her to a P.O. box in Minnesota with no return address on the box. He would just go to a P.O. box and she wouldn't know where he lived or anything like that. Like no attachments. Okay. Whatsoever. Okay. But Emily messaged him and then said this later. Quote, the creepiest thing I ever saw the doll actually do is when I boxed it up to send it to a friend in Minnesota. Oh, God. It laughed for about 30 seconds straight. Usually it would have a little giggle after saying something, which she proved in that video like it does like have a little fucking giggle but it has never laughed like that before oh god and that chilled me to the bone (sighs) my husband and i both looked at it in horror before we takes before we taped the box shut drove it to the post office and mailed it off so anyway chris received the package on january 14th now remember she only first posted about this on christmas eve okay so So her fucking world has been a a whirlwind yeah so chris ran to the post office got the thing well no he drove he has a jeep oh (laughs) Uh, (laughs) anyway he got got his steps in (laughs) (laughs) all right and then so chris receives the package on january 14th and sends Emily a picture of the empty box he had just <gasps> received. Shut the fuck up. He was fucking with her. Oh. He is taking the doll oh out and a picture of the empty box. <laughs> what a dick. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what he, the reason why he wanted the doll was because he, he's skeptic. And so is Emily. She's like, I've never had anything like this happen before. I still don't really know what to believe. Yeah. But he wanted the doll <laughs> as a creepy hood ornament. <laughs> for his little jeep oh my and i say God. little jeep i think it's like a uh like a vintage thing it's oh yeah like, yeah that's such an asshole move though like yeah him a big picture time. Of the empty box. <laughs> like <gasps> yeah and it was like wasn't there supposed to be a doll in here oh my God. um <laughs> so anyway on the 27th of february 2020 emily's facebook read aurelia has been begging me to get the elsa doll back all day today she said she wants it to sleep in her bed. Ew. Shudder. And that she misses it. Hashtag too soon. Hashtag all the nopes. No thanks. And case closed. Yeah. Get her something. Get her a dog. She'll forget. Yeah. But this is the thing. They like this wasn't like a favorite doll of hers or anything. So random. And just randomly like fucking well, yeah, a month later. Yeah. She fucked it off. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. But I think they. When Emily was talking about like the the whole fucking saga, she said the kids were never afraid. I think they tried to make sure that they the kids didn't realize that their parents were terrified. Yeah. But they were thinking like, oh my God, it's like the tooth fairy. That's yeah. what it, the way they compared it. Anyway, I did try and find out some updates from Chris Hogan's Twitter page. Mm-hmm. But he is a fucking serial tweeter. And like, you know the way it says being a tweet Twitter member since like 2018 mm-hmm. he has posted like fifty thousand tweets okay in that two-year fucking span or well, three-year span now and he was even live tweeting as i was trying to scroll down through his page wow. so after about five or ten minutes i was like i can't actually deal with this the furthest i got was yesterday <laughs> <laughs> damn yeah so i was like okay i'm not gonna find this out but after i failed miserably at that i <laughs> Realized that Emily has actually been the one podcast that she spoke to mm. was Haunted AF. Okay. And I'm a fan of their show. Like we've uh. spoken to them before, but I I haven't listened to that. Episode, those two yeah. episodes, she, she gave updates, uh-huh. but I will be listening to them over probably tomorrow, to be honest. Uh-huh. And I urge all of you creeps to do the same because again, they are funny. They do a good show. It's very uh, Jim Harold esque like uh-huh. people phone in their own stories or they just read out stories. 
Mm-hmm. So definitely check it out. I'll uh, I'll link the the episodes in our show notes of this. And then I did also read on one of those articles that after the doll left the house, they did have a few like random doors opening on their own and like small bits and bobs happening. Weird. But again, being the skeptic, they just kind of brushed it off. They were yeah. like, that was one fucking weird encounter. Mm-hmm. Let's just leave it at that. And then I did on one of the Facebook posts that because I read through all the comments and a lot of it was just like their friends joking and stuff because she didn't accept all the people who tried to add her on Facebook. So I don't think people could comment like randomers. But there was one like spiritualist. His name was like Hector Hector. Mm-hmm. And uh, his comment was like, the reason the doll keeps coming back is because it's a spirit who enjoys being in your company and I guess uses the doll as a way to attach itself to that your energy or blah blah blah. So he didn't necessarily think it was a bad thing or anything like that. Like maybe it was a grandmother or something like mm-hmm. but they felt like their doll was their medium like to be in the house or something. Okay. So almost like an avatar. Yeah. You know? Which I thought was an interesting take. Anyway, so I found that story and it was too good not to tell. Mm -hmm. But it was also kind of too short for (laughs) a creep. So I started looking up more stuff. And I found this one. This one's very short, but very recent also. Another recent creepy doll encounter was an Elmo Knows Your Name doll. The fuck? Yeah, you know the way like there's all sorts of different like... Tickle me, Elmo. Come have a smoke with me, Elmo. And all these different yeah, fucking Yeah, I just remember Elmo his dolls. laughing like, ha, 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 Yeah. <laughs> Incessant fucking laughter. <laughs> I like his laugh. Well, anyway, Elmo Knows Your Name was a doll that was programmed to speak its owner's name and apparently a few other, like, phrases. So the Bowman family bought one for their two-year-old son, James, in 2008. And it was fine. Like, it did all what it was supposed to do. But after they changed its batteries... Oh. He just started to say, in Elmo's lovely, charming, endearing voice, kill James. What? On repeat, every <gasps> time they touched it. Who the fuck was James? The kid, their son, the oh two-year-old son, James, yeah. Um, And this is how it sounded. No way. Hold on two seconds. No. Yes way. No. Kill James. Kill James. Kill James. But yeah, so you can clearly hear it say, kill James. Yeah. I'll have the audio in here. But I would also like to point out that, one, in typical classy local news fashion, the headline reads, Death Threat Elmo. (laughs) Um, But the person's house is full of... Dolls? Elmos. Oh, wow. Like, they had all, like, not just Sesame Street, but Uh Elmo in particular. Like, that was Elmo with a talking pizza. And, like, in the background, you can see, like, the child stroller and stuff. So, like, they're no stranger to the Elmo fucking merchandise or whatever. Yeah. But this one quite clearly says, kill James. But don't worry, because Fisher Price did send them a voucher for a new doll. Good. Yeah. That won't kill James. Well, hopefully not. Or if he does, he'll do it quietly. Um, and he'll probably laugh about it. (laughs) And last on today's list is probably very famous, but it was the first time I had heard of it. Because, like, obviously there's Annabelle and, like, Robert the doll and Peggy the doll. And I don't know how much, like, credence I can put into them. Like, they all have cool fucking stories. Like, I love the story of Robert the doll, you know? Yeah. But this little guy is called Charlie. And I just took the story for face value. I'm not going to question any of it. And I feel like a lot of good ghost stories need to be taken that way sometimes. So Charlie was discovered in the attic of an old Victorian home in upstate New York. He was in the bottom of an old ass trunk full of newspapers from the 1930s. Cold ass trunk. The only other item was a yellowed piece of paper containing our Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Now Charlie's age is unknown, but unlike Elsa and Elmo, he's a creepy looking bastard. Mm. Like... Charlie is exactly what you would expect a haunted doll to look like. Mm. And I will have pictures to go along with this. Oh, good. So. Great. (laughs) (laughs) We don't know how old he was. The newspapers in the trunk that he liked to store him in were from the 30s. And he was found in, I think, 1968. The family who found him, luckily enough, 
already had a doll collection. Oh, nice. Yeah, so Score. The, yeah, they were like, <laughs> free doll in the attic. <laughs> it's our lucky day, Olivia. They were more than happy to add Charlie to their little porcelain doll family. And he fit right in. At first. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So pretty soon, Charlie seemed to be like just moving around. Like they would have him, like, you know, have their dolls displayed mm-hmm. as you display dolls. Yeah, on as display. you do. Mm-hmm. And then they noticed like Charlie was, you know, the third doll in the row of 82 to the <laughs> left. And all of a sudden the next day he was 17th in the row. And then the day after oh. that he was 10. These numbers are probably blowing it out of proportion. But he was like moved within the dolls, like not just his. Like musical chairs. Yeah, like not like just his position, like his actual location on the bench. Mm-hmm. But naturally the parents blame their kids for fucking around with the. They're adult toys which should not be touched by the grubby hands of children. <laughs> <laughs> they had five daughters who everywhere it says five mischievous daughters. Mm. But they're just little girls like yeah. and all the little girls are like, no, like we know well not to go near your not toys that are toys that are not to be played with like toys. You freaks. Yes. Yeah. Now, please, can we leave and go to private school or boarding school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but pretty soon, however, the youngest daughter, we don't have any names, but she was four at the time. And she told her parents one night that as she went to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, she was the only one awake. Charlie had spoken to her. <gasps> yes. From his place on the bench. They didn't believe her. The fuck did he say? I don't know. It's just, he just spoke to her. Oh. He was just like, Hey, enjoy your piss. <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> like, don't forget to wipe. <laughs> this is my voice. This is how Charlie sounds. Sound like Peter Griffin. Upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, they just told her, look, it's, you're just imagining things. You know, it was late. You were half asleep. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. But not long after the youngest came out with this, the other four girls soon became terrified of Charlie. Like, none of them would leave their rooms at night. Whoa. Like, even if they had to piss or anything, like, they just, they would not leave the room. And even during the day, I'm pretty sure Charlie was, like, on the landing, maybe. Mm-hmm. And that's why they were so afraid. And I would be terrified. Mm-hmm. My little sisters had, like, this clown thing that our granny's sister-in-law used to make as a hobby. Fucking awful. And if Roisin's door was open, I would see it at night and it would terrify me. Mm-hmm. So I can completely understand where these little girls are coming from. I was that little girl once. <laughs> but anyway, they would like during the day, even if they had to go past them, they would like walk on the other side of the landing and like as far away as possibly. Yeah. As they possibly could get. And then finally, the youngest girl awoke one morning completely covered in scratches. <gasps> They looked like cat scratches. Mm-hmm. And I think the parents were blaming her for pissing off the cat. But she assured them that it was Charlie that did this, mm-hmm. not the family cat. And so the parents decided to lock Charlie back in his trunk. I think, you know, being the late 1960s, they just decided to never mention it again. Mm-hmm. You know, this thing is scaring the children. Let's just put it out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. I don't know whether they put any credence into it being haunted, but the kids were afraid, so let's just get fucking rid of it. And definitely don't tell any of the neighbors. He was forgotten about okay. for years and years. Mm-hmm. The parents died, the kids came back, and they were doing an estate sale, a big garage sale on the, the front lawn. And they found Charlie in the attic, in his trunk, so they decided to sell him along with the rest of the stuff. He was one of the last things to be sold, But again, he ended up in the hands of an antique doll enthusiast. Okay. Now, I don't know what year this was or anything. But since then, the doll has changed hands a few more times. I think by this stage, his story is like his selling point. Mm -hmm. So the people who purchase him are well aware that he is supposedly haunted. And that's what makes them so eager to get a hold of him. He is still said to move on his own from time to time. But it's said that his energy only really affects children or that his own his energy only really like kicks up when he's around children. Weird. 
Yeah, so maybe maybe he's just a little boy, do you know what I mean? Or a little girl yeah. attached to this thing, who knows? Or a pervo. Or a pervo, yeah, I was trying to stare away from that, you know, keeping it light. But Charlie now lives at a shop called Local Artisan. This is a quote from Atlas Obscura. There he sits among taxidermy animals, unusual art and other oddities where he can be viewed by the public at 34 Cabot Street or Cabot Street in Beverly, Massachusetts, just outside of Salam. <laughs> I misspelled Salem in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> you did? <Yeah>. Salam. <laughs> I don't know where salam is, but... <laughs> it sounds hammy. Sounds, yeah, it sounds kind of spicy. But yeah, there you go, guys. There's just a little handful of haunted dolls, haunted doll stories. I tried to find, like, some current ones. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're the ones that I love. Like, obviously, I love all the old classic stories, but when I see a good Recent modern one. ghost story, I'm like, yeah. oh. Yeah. Oh, shit. Um, oh, oh, shit, indeed. Oh, shit, indeed. Hmm. but i don't know what i would do like the elmo one that was just fucking weird but i'm actually more freaked out by the amount of elmos in that house now that <laughs> i've watched that video a couple of times an elmo with a talking pizza yeah we can re-watch that clip i'll show you okay. I, I i'm pretty sure that's what i saw i think that's the scariest one yeah because pizza shouldn't talk. eat me yeah <laughs> i'm salam <laughs> uh Taste anyway my salam <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so we hope you guys enjoyed i'm hoping to come back next week with a little series might not be a full series it might just be a really deep dive on one episode mm. but it's gonna be pretty girthy i think yeah you already have it in the works yeah i just didn't have time to get through the book okay because of our because of our hectic life schedule. Yeah, we do have a hectic life schedule now. Yeah, just this week because of like interviews and shit like that. And Not even, dude. You're going to have like a full-time job and a part-time job. Yeah, but this week in particular was hectic. I just haven't been able to fall into a routine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, guys, as always, thank you very much for listening. If you want more content, feel free to reach out to the Patreon page uh not reach out sign up rather for as little as two dollars you can have access to pretty much everything um i think there's a there's a lot of crap on there now like mini episodes funny little videos that we do a few more of dulce's makeup videos are on there because she hasn't made her makeup page yet even though people keep telling her to i will um follow us on instagram if you're not already send us in your stories to weeklycreep at gmail.com so we can read them out on next month's titillating tales of true terror um follow our youtube channel we do leak some of the patreon content on there sometimes so we you can see stuff on there it. and that's probably about it that's me slapping myself yes oh if you're listening on itunes make sure to leave us a delicious itunes review five stars all of the love and uh that's I don't it. know. We've been watching a lot of Eamon and Beck. Call your friends. Tell them that you love them. Yeah. That's a nice thing to do. It Call is. Call your family. Say, family member. You suck. I love you. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. That's it. All right. Bye. Until next week. Bye.